Hello, one day is Thursday, July 20th, 2023, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, I'll have a lot to say about that, as I normally do. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks, as usual, just hold off until we get to the live charts, and we'll do crypto first, as usual. So what we're going to focus on, well, I want to sort of make hay while the sun shines. I think it's important to discuss the methodology in action, especially when there's something to do, and especially after we've been waiting for a long time and the market finally begins to take off today downstanding, obviously. And that'll make a lot more sense in just a few minutes. And a couple of mystery charts, these are new setups, like I do over the Trading Simplified show. I wanna talk a little bit about patience and how that can really pay off. And then talk about going back to the well. You get into a position and then you get knocked out of it at a profit and sometimes a loss. And then you go back and take that same position again, provided, of course, it's set up. And then obviously, we'll talk a little bit about free rolling because that's something that we've done quite a bit of lately. Knock on wood. Come in. <laughs> and also, we'll talk a little bit about uh, an IPO that might be ready to buy. All right. This is Claim Screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as I'll just sum it up. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right. Let's we'll talk about the mystery charts and the methodology and action. Here's our first mystery chart. Now, it's a little unorthodox because you'll notice you're like, hey, Dave, it's got a lot of days at a pullback. I realize that. But with IPOs, with these first deep retracement where they just kind of take off and go to the moon a little bit and then they come back in. I'm willing to give them a few days or quite a few days to trigger. So the parameters are down below 45, 20, 38, 50, and 51, 90 for the entry, the stop, and the initial protective, I'm sorry, the initial profit target, respectively. So entry is there. You can see it came fairly close to entering, uh, to triggering, I should say, but then it came back in. I always wait for an entry. As I preach ad nauseum, I'll get an email six months from now about a stock that's lost 80% of its value or 50% of its value or whatever. And uh, the client will be complaining. And I'm like, well, I never would recommend a turd like that. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, you did. And then I go back and look, it's like, well, it certainly did, but it never did trigger. Surprised at how many people will take trades that don't even trigger. I guess everybody craves action. As I said before, I lose clients when I don't recommend doing anything. I lost clients over this last little flat period. In fact, one, I told him that the next guy is going to look like a genius, and we'll get to that too. We've been talking about that quite a bit lately. So here's the mystery chart for this week. Nice little Landry Light pullback. Actually, we have another mystery chart. The other one was a mystery chart too. You can see these once they trigger, and even if they don't trigger, but once I take them off of my official recommendation list, you can see them at davelearn.com slash archives. It's a great exercise, if I say so myself, and going through these stocks because you'll see when i recommend the stock i'll tell you why i like it uh maybe a, a couple things to note about it maybe a couple things to be concerned about but why i like it anyway etc and then along with the risk parameters too so you get, kind of get in my head which you probably don't want to be for a lot of things but for trading you might want to be when it comes to these core methodology type of setups so the parameters are 425, a protective stop of 30. That's the entry, 425 of three, protective stop. Let me just rewind it. Roop. Entry of 4.25, protective stop of three. Now that seems kind of wild and crazy, but the HV on this stock is very high. I think it's triple digits, historical volatility on a 50-day basis. And then the IPT is 550. So that's a buck 25. I know percentage wise, that's crazy, but that's what it called for. It was just at five not that long ago. Now it's at three and, and a half. Anyway, entry's here, stop is here, IPT is here. For those newer or new to my methodology, we trade like swing traders, but we do put a bigger picture pattern behind us, such as the setup in and of itself. And then sometimes even bigger picture patterns like cup and handles double bottoms on things of that nature. In this case, you've got a nice, nice, nice uptrend. It's also accelerating. You've got Landry light, as you can see, then it pulls back to 30 EMA. 
Now this down here, just in case somebody's gonna ask, because somebody will, is how many days the lows are greater than the moving average. And on the downside, how many days the highs are less than the moving average. And if you don't see anything like zero, like you're seeing now, it means the price is intersecting the moving average. Very simple thing to scan for, or you can just look for 20 days of daylight and then look for zero days of daylight. And that would have alerted you on this day here that we had a setup. So pulls back to touch the EMA. And if you're looking at, I guess it was Dave Landry's 10 best and possibly the layman's guide to trading stocks. I call these things daylight pullbacks or kiss my goodbye. Kiss my goodbye or daylight pullbacks. One of those two things. But the new name for them is Landry Light Pullbacks. And now you don't just want to trade these mechanically. You want to look for something like persistency and acceleration. Notice that it took off, consolidated just a little bit, didn't do anything wrong, but then it really accelerated higher before a nice little correction in here. So make sure you're picking the best, leaving the rest, make sure there's no overhead supply and all those things we talk about quite often. By the way, bring up a stock at Facebook and we'll noodle with it. And as you probably know, I'll point out stocks with overhead supply. And that's one way to become a better and better stock picker. And a lot of you guys at the group, I know everybody here tonight knows what they're doing, will help other guys out, which is nice. And I appreciate that. You're like, oh, I know what Dave's going to say. It's got a lot of overhead supply or whatever. And just, just learn from each one. It's like, okay, I'm going to show one. But first of all, I'm going to make sure it doesn't have any overhead supply because I don't want Dave to once again kind of beat me up on that. And by the way, if you are a client and you give me permission, I will give you tough love. And the reason I say that is um, I've had people go many, many years not being clients, but just kind of pick my brain constantly. And I'm thinking this guy is uh, mentally challenged or whatever. And then I find out that they never bother to even invest in themselves by picking up any product or, or even reading a book that's free uh, from me. So either you want it or you don't. And in this case, there's been a couple of these over the years. Uh, sometimes you just don't. And that's okay. Just don't bother me <laughs> if you don't. If you're serious, I'm all in with you. All right, so this was SYM. I just want to show this one really quick. The entry was here, the stop was here, the IPT was here. And notice that we stopped out on this one. And it turned out to be a $3,500 gain. And it was $1,000 banked and then $2,500 on the trend, trend trading loaf per 100K. So the hypothetical model is based on a 100K account, just FYI. Now, later that day, I'm going to sound more coon ass than uh, SpongeBob, right? Notice that I recommended it again. So you can see this time only 200 shares because, and notice, look, it stopped out up here, okay? So you can see it stopped out up here on this day. And again, you could you could find all of these recommendations at that aforementioned link, davelearner.com slash archives. So we made 3,500 per 100K, okay? And, you know, I looked at it and said, it still looks pretty darn good because now it's a Landry Light pullback. I think it's worth a shot. And you can see I have it down here, entry of 45, protective stop of 35, IPT or initial profit target of 55. And we actually lowered those parameters a little bit as it pulled back a little further. Those were the original parameters. Once again, you've got nice, nice, nice Landry Light, almost textbook in nature in fact this other setup here was just absolutely beautiful and i'm kicking myself in the ass because after it triggered i was going to put it on twitter and just say this is a really good looking setup because you've got nice you got a nice uptrend in here you've got acceleration you got the landry light it's a clean setup a lot of things going for it and then once again it's a pretty good looking setup so again landry light pullback notice that the landry light count was right around 20. And that's a good number for account if you're doing Landry Light pullbacks. And if you're newer or to trading, I would suggest you do something like Landry Light pullbacks. As Linda Rasky once said, all you need is one pattern to be successful. And I think this might be the pattern, as I've said in recent weeks. And go in and watch those archives. And you can find them on my website, davelandry.com, for those uh, shows. Or if you go to YouTube, it's YouTube slash Dave Landry. Anyway, a little Landry Light pullback there, IPT up here. And let's take a look at what happened. You can see that it rallied up and hit the IPT. 
Now, when you hit the IPT, you might trail a little bit before the IPT is hit, but as soon as that IPT is hit, even if, if it's intraday, and I know I'm beating the dead horse here, but we've got new people or people coming and going, I should say, so I need to kind of reiterate some of these concepts. It'll save me from answering a lot of questions later. But leave a comment below if you are on YouTube and like the video if you like it. If you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. I guess it doesn't matter anymore because YouTube doesn't show the, the dislikes. You know, <laughs> you see the memes out there. You know, it's like you got a YouTube video on something, instructional video, and you go try to make it. It just turns out to be a mess and it doesn't work. And that happens. That 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 tended to happen after the likes. Uh, they removed the dislikes. <laughs> Some had a thousand dislikes. So like, okay, I'm not gonna try to build that. Anyway, I digress. You can see we came uh, fairly close to the stop within about a couple of points of it today, but so far so good. And I'm hoping, I know you should never hope in this business, but I'm hoping it doesn't turn into a better than Pokemon I trade. Better than Pokemon I trade, you get the first loaf off and then you stop at, at break even. And it's much better than the Pokemon eye. If anybody complains about them, I tell them to send me the money and nobody has yet to send me the money. Anyway, so in a case like this, when you hit that IPT, initial profit target, you want to exit half of your shares, and but in doing so, per 100K, again, 2% risk would be $2,000 open profit. You bank half, that, so you put $1,000 in your account. And it's a nice way to put a little money in your account as you go, especially when you're in a nice momentum period like we have been in as of late. And I'm going to talk a lot more about patience in just one second. Now, I know I've talked about this one a few weeks ago, but it, it is psychologically that it, it hadn't worked out just yet when I first started talking about it. But now it's working. It's a little bit easier to talk about, right? But psychologically, it could be real tough. And you have to treat each setup as a standalone setup. You have to pretend that you're just seeing it for the first time. And remember, that stock has no memory of you okay it doesn't know that you were just long that stock three hours earlier now you do have to separate yourself from the extraneous and that's something i've been harping on quite a bit lately and that's something that i've been writing pages and pages and pages on is that your life influences your trading and your trading influences your life and then it becomes cyclical and sometimes you can get in a negative feedback loop if home life's not great you try to take some of that frustrations out in your trading, and boy, the market will just <laughs> kick your kick your butt. But separating yourself from the extraneous in this case is you need to forget about what affinity you might have had for the stock or animosity, because the stock could have easily turned into a losing trade on the prior trade and then set up perfectly again. Or in some rare cases, maybe knock you out and form like a TKO pattern. Uh, right after you get in it or soon after you get in it and then it makes this beautiful TKO and then you can look to re-enter above the TKO high. So you got to forget that you were in it and how you felt about being in it. And another thing too, which kind of dovetails in with the affinity for the stock that you might have, is the longer you hold a stock, the the more you sort of feel like it's yours and you the endowment effect begins to kick in and uh thinking fast and slow i dug that out earlier today because i couldn't remember the word endowment for some reason i kept thinking inherited or something else um, anyway but the endowment effect is like you get used to having something and they've done a lot of experiments that have nothing to do with stocks but they there's been a whole bunch of experiments where like people, they'll give you something to make or whatever, and then you you decide to price it as opposed to if somebody else makes something and you decide to, you know, then they ask you to price it. If you you got a little bit into it, you you kind of become attached to it. And there's a lot of these forces that are always working against you, and you don't know that they are. You just don't feel kind of right about something, and then you might not be following your plan, and you're trying to figure out why you're not following your plan. And then as the kind of the onion, what's the what's the phrase of the, the onion and the peels onion? What am I looking for? Layer by layer, you know, you, you slowly begin to have these little epiphanies and maybe you read a non-trading book like Thinking Fast and Slow. And like, OK, I, now I get it. It's like the I forget where it was uh, first written. 
Uh, it might have been either Gary Klein. There's another gentleman, I can't think of his name, that writes some really good psychology books uh, along, of course, with um, Thinking Fast and Slow. But anyway, talk about the hungry, hungry judge effect. And it's like I I would come into my office, and I know I tell the story every week, but it's like these little epiphanies just kind of blow me away. I'd come in my office after breakfast and then after lunch, and I didn't wasn't thinking about it at the time. I just felt like I was coming to my office, and I was like all of a sudden I'd see these trades set up, and I'd just hop in and I'd lose money. I'm like, why am I so anxious to trade when I get back to the office? When I left the office, it's like everything looked like crap. And then I, I learned that, oh, okay, I was sugar low, and I was angry or hangry, and then I left the office, ate something, came back in feeling really good, and that's the the study they did on the Israeli judges was after lunch, their sentences were far more lenient than before. Anyway, long story endless, be cognizant of the endowment effect. The longer you hold something, and especially if you're doing really well with it, the harder it is to get rid of it. Now, just be prepared to live with the outcome. And another thing I've been working on is avoiding hindsight bias. Now you'll never avoid all hindsight bias, but you will avoid the the hindsight bias that is not truly hindsight bias. It was something that was that was there all along. So let's say you've got a stock that um, really was kind of choppy and really wasn't a beautiful setup, but you took it anyway. If you do a serious pre-mortem, like kind of time travel and write your post-mortem and say, uh, I took this stock because it was choppy and really wasn't trending and the setup kind of sucked, but I just felt like taking it. And obviously, you would never go into a trade with that kind of thinking. But if you could put yourself in that mindset to where you love the setup going in, and, and the best way to describe it, and I've yet to find a better term, is F, yeah, you're feeling that F, yeah, feeling, then by all means, number one, take the trade, and number two, live with the outcome, and try doing the pre-mortem. It's like, uh, yep, the trend was there, the setup was there, the sector was there, the market was there, or as many pieces you can find, just put all those pieces together. And do that before you get into the trade, but kind of like from a standpoint of how you would feel if you got stopped out, if the trade failed miserably, could you live with yourself? Okay, so there's two different kind of two different things I'm saying at once, but the pre-mortem is kind of more of a time travel type of thing. So you're not having that regret that that's over that's really already there okay so in other words you regret that wow i regret taking this trade because it was choppy and crappy looking but i took it anyway okay so you got to give your mind a few minutes to kind of process these type of things and sometimes as i've said before based on the neurology it just takes a few seconds to bypass the more emotional part of your brain that low that so-called lizard brain down there and I could never understand how that one little part could be could make you so emotional. But what it does is it sends out sends out signals to the rest of your brain and lights up the rest of your brain and kind of hijacks the rest of your brain. But if you give it a little bit of time and think clearly and look at things, then all this begins to process and you begin getting into more of a whole brain approach. I know I digress, but <laughs> that's how I roll. Now, one thing I've been following up on lately is on May 3rd, I believe, I get them mixed up because I answered them the next day in my service, whatever dates on my service, it's it's published the night before for the next day. So tonight's service was dated 721 for Friday tomorrow. But anyway, just paraphrasing, I said, assuming that the next guy is a trend follower, this guy was kind of, I guess, bored with sitting on his hands or wanted some kind of action. And there was no action to be taken. And I said, look, here's a deal. Why don't you hang out a little while longer? I don't know if he did or not. I don't want to pour salt in his wounds. But I said, because assuming that the next guy is a trend follower, he was looking for someone else to give him advice. I said, he's going to look like a genius. And the next guy did look like a genius. And one of the next guys, me. So at the peak recently, it was well over 12 or 13K. 
and this isn't a day by day. These are just, just the trades, and some of these trades are still open, so this graph's going to kind of change a little bit. There was one losing trade since, and it's not always like that, believe me. This is what we live for, okay, these nice runs like this. And the real money would be if one of those stocks, we'll take a look at the portfolio here. I think the biggest winner might be about 2K, especially after today. But it'd be great if one of those stocks really took off. And that's the ultimate goal is to get a 40 or $50,000 move, some sort of like 400 or 500% move on a stock. And it doesn't happen that often. I don't make it sound like it happens that often. But if you do a lot of waiting, they will eventually come along in forty, fifty thousand dollars on a hundred k account, and that could really, really make your year certainly cover a lot of damage or just normal drawdowns. Anyway, this all began with the day I received the email. The I checked the portfolio, and we just had riot in the portfolio, and it was underwater by two thirty three. So from negative two thirty three to a nice uh, run. Here's the current portfolio, as I told you a second ago. It looked a lot better yesterday. <laughs> uh, we took a little bit of a hit today, but it comes with the territory. Everything was overbought and due for a pullback, and it is what it is. And so the biggest winner right now is Riot. You can see 1769 plus 1,000 banks, so 2769. But the real money is in this second loaf, and this is where sometimes you get – the 50%, 100%, or 200%, or 500% move. Not that often, but every now and then. And now we have a 50% here, 40 something percent here. And you can see so far, so good. Again, knock on wood implied, but you could look at these shares here where this is free rolling. So whenever you see the white followed by the yellow, that position is still on. And this is the trending loaf, so to speak, and this is the trading loaf, so to speak. So we bank those profits just in case that market comes right back in. At least we get something. And the other thing it does, by the way, it's like you think today was was choppy, okay, as far as or was a was a hit, okay? That was open profit drawdowns hit. If we had the rest of the position still on then that hit would have been much, much, much worse. So we're trying to mitigate those swings longer term. We're trying to make sure we're taking some money off the table. Uh, what does Linda Rasky say? Take a cookie when they pass the tray around, feed the ducks while they're quacking, those type of things. And that first swing trade loaf keeps you in the game. It'll, and not a lot of times, but sometimes you'll get into a, a market that's just trying to get going but can't quite get there. And it's like you you hit the IPT, comes in, hit the IPT, comes in. And it seems like you're never going to get any big winner, but you just keep chipping away at it and you get these little small gains out, which are much better than a poke in the eye, especially if you get a few of them. And then eventually the market takes off. Now, uh, as I've said before, whenever... We hit the IPT, come back in, hit the IPT, come back in, make a thousand, scratch out, make a thousand, scratch out, make a thousand, scratch out per 100K again with the hypothetical model. I do take these actual trades though, and I do take a representative trade for anything I recommend so I can show you the actual trade. But anyway, when the market hits the IPT, comes right back in, I get emails from people saying, why don't we take the full loaf? Well, because you're not going to get rich longer term by doing that because you're never going to catch a big winner. And it just so happens to be that's what happened in the market recently, just like we sit on our hands when the market is not doing anything. The more I learn about myself, the better trader I'm becoming. Absolutely, George. Yeah, it's like uh, one of the topics I'm working on is work 10 times as hard on yourself. In this uh, this this book I've been working on for years as a different form, and I'm going to probably change it up and summarize it to, to get it out quicker. Quicker being meaning probably two years from now because <laughs> uh, it's a slow process. But I'm actually putting psychology up front where I think it belongs, and it's hard to get somebody to work on themselves before they they just jump in and grill hunt and do all this thing things. But hopefully, I could stop that from happening. And, you know, the other thing I'm seeing a lot of now is uh, I'm seeing some people that are like, okay, I get it, you know, and it's like, and then they're, and then they're off to, to be by themselves 
without any help or without it's like they quit the they quit the the membership either the goal of membership or the service whatever the case may be where they have access to the facebook group they just think okay i get it now all of a sudden bam they start hitting out the park they catch four or five big winners like we just did and they're like okay i've got it i've got it and then they 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 run away you know it's like wait a minute hang on when things get good you want to make sure that you're you have help from others you want to make sure you're interacting a little bit i know i get a lot of the facebook group not trying to soft sell you because everybody here's already in it but i uh i get a lot out of the group myself it reminds me to take certain trades reminds me to look at certain stocks and and on things of that nature all right so the secret to trading is learning how to wait so you you trade you wait you trade Figuring out when to trade is not hard. Right now is a good time to be trading, okay? A few months ago was not. From prior to May, it's like I explained to my wife, because um, every summer, it's like the same old crap. It's like the market just starts getting really choppy, and it's just business gets bad, and, and it's like can't make any money trading. It's like the same old dumb summer doldrums every year. And I explained to her, it's like summer came early and lasted about six months. <laughs> Laugh to keep from crying. I'm sure anybody who's hung out with me over that period of time knows exactly what I'm saying or try to do it on your own. Now, when you're in this wait mode, and I've done a lot of presentations just on um, patience. But uh, there's a Livermore quote that basically says, to summarize, feeling like you have to be in the market every day is is uh, is how a lot of people lose money. And when the market is just kind of chopping around, and I'm assuming that's what he's referring to, all those players, as Livermore said, are are laying the groundwork for your next venture. They're building the foundation, I think is what he said. And if you think about it, let's say you've got a big old base in a market, that's kind of like a foundation, a base, right? And then the market takes off, you play that first pull back or the bow tie or whatever, by sitting there patiently while it just chops around and waiting for a setup, you avoid getting chewed up. And the secret while waiting is not doing too much, okay? And that's gonna keep you in the game both mentally and monetarily. And in all these old books I read on um, trading, they all talk about losing your nerve. Well, you lose your nerve while you're not waiting when you should be waiting. And if you think about it, you figure out when to wait and do nothing, then you'll pretty much own the world. And you're like, well, Dave, how do you know when to trade? It's like, well, you'll know when it's time to trade. Would you start, like, if I can't find a setup to save my life, my Landry list, list I publish every day, if it's zero stocks that I find worthwhile, or maybe just two or three, if the list is that small, there's probably not that many stocks out there. And, and going through the database, if I see choppy, choppy, choppy markets, if I see lack of follow through every day, if I see setup after setup that looks good, but then absolutely fails, in, in a lot of cases, don't trigger, uh, they don't trigger then I know that conditions aren't conducive. So the secret to trading is knowing when to wait. Easier said than done. Okay, I wanna show you an IPO real quick and then we'll jump into live charts. So here's the case of go or no go. Um, John, I think brought this one up in the group, if not, <laughs> John gets all the credit for IPOs and I know other guys and girls are bringing them up. So I need to make sure if it's not John, I give them credit too. But uh, anyway, last week we talked about the day one rule. So day one, day two, day three, day four. So day one high is greater than the next three highs, okay? Or if the day one high is not exceeded. I wrote it. If you go back two weekend charts ago, or maybe one weekend chart ago, you'll see where I went through a lot of details on this. But anyway, based on this, the buy at B would be a close above this high. So 
Notice that it did pierce above that high. That doesn't count. It actually has to close above that high. Now, am I taking it? No. And one reason is the range is okay. I like to see a little bit more range in my IPOs. And the other thing is with an IPO for a pioneer setup, not for a first pullback, okay, or some of the other tr setups we trade, but for a pioneer setup, meaning that we're getting in early, as early as day five on the close. This thing comes public on Monday, and on Friday at the close, we might actually be looking to buy this stock, or, or an IPO, I should say. I do think it's okay to say, well, hang on a second. This is like a stodgy old oil company that's coming republic, so to speak, if that's a word. Or this is a brick and mortar retailer like Academy was. Well, Academy had a, a buy a B or something pioneer set up and I ignored it because it's a brick and mortar retailer in this day and age. How the hell are they going to make money? Well, this thing called the pandemic came along and they did, the stock did incredibly well. Now, I did take the secondary setup, ASO, and if you go and look, look at those aforementioned archives, I guess that was in 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, I took a secondary setup, and I don't worry so much about what's the story, fat or glory, but you want some kind of excitement if you're going to go in and take these pioneer setups. I'm not saying fundamentals, but I'm looking for some sort of fad, some kind of story like a hair product that everybody's excited about or some jeans that that uh, teenage girls are willing to pay 100 bucks for or their parents are willing to pay 100 bucks for. I guess that's cheap nowadays, maybe 150 bucks or something. But something along those lines. So I did a YouTube, I'm sorry, a Yahoo Finance lookup on this thing. And it says Savers Village, Value Village Incorporated sells secondhand merchandise at retail stores in the United States, Canada, and Australia. Now, maybe maybe it's an awesome store. I don't know. But I'm having a hard time getting excited about a secondhand store. I mean, you know, I, I don't mind going and pop some tags every now and then. You know, I'm going to pop some tags. <laughs> I got 20 hours in my life. But I'm not going to get that excited about uh, a retailer like this. Anyway, so... I'm going to go ahead and pass on this. John says he's going to pass too. I agree with you. Now, this doesn't mean that this thing, this thing may be the hottest store in hot town. I don't know. There's none around here. I think the closest one's in Missouri. And I'm certainly not going to go over there to check it out. Not that I'm confusing the issue of facts, but you kind of get the idea. So maybe it could be a fad. I don't know. But on a pioneer setup like that, I'm going to be a little bit more stringent and I'm going to actually think about what they're doing. And I see a lot of oil companies come public, uh, republic, I guess, like they'll go bankrupt and then somehow I don't know how they do it again, but they'll IPO again. And I'm like, wait a minute, isn't that that old oil company that went bankrupt years ago? It's like, I think I'm going to wait for a secondary setup. All right, let's jump into crypto. Yeah, I agree with you on that one, John. All right, so let's take a look at crypto, and then we'll hop into the overall market. Now, I haven't been focused a lot on crypto lately. I haven't found a whole lot of setups lately in crypto. But as I've said quite a bit, crypto heats up and cools off really, really fast. So you really have to be on your toes. Let's just take a look at some of the big ones. And if there's some smaller pairs you guys want to look at, we'll take a look at that. But you see, Bitcoin has pulled back to the 30 EMA, and right now it's just it's just stuck in this range, as you can see. So that's a bit of a bummer. And I don't want to use the word hope, but hopefully it'll find support down here and, and then begin to take off. As I often say, I'm kind of a closet bull, well, maybe not so much a closet bull, or Bitcoin, but I'm also not stupid. It's sideways right now. So as a trend follower, I'm not too excited about it. But I do think there's some potential there. And when it goes, it goes. One thing I've been finding kind of interesting is the crypto stocks 
and maybe this is just a feeling, but it sure seems like you take a look at like Riot that we looked at earlier, and we could pull it up in a second, which is in the portfolio. It's it doesn't seem like it's coming in that much compared to what Bitcoin is doing. It'd be, it would be kind of fun. I don't even know part of me, but uh, I think you'd put in like um, you could put in Riot colon and then dollar sign. BTC USD in stock charts, and that'll show you the strength of Bitcoin or the weakness of Bitcoin versus Riot. I wonder if you could do it in, in a, let me see if you could do it in, I don't know if you could, does anyone know if you could do it in a ACP? Let's see what happens. Oh, did it work? Yeah, it worked. Um, let's take a look at this. I don't know if it's still shared or not. Let's see if we can do it. Yeah, so what I was feeling or seeing empirically is the same as what's actually happening. So it's actually, it is happening. So let's make sure when, is everybody, you seeing Riot? You should be seeing Riot now. Okay, so that's Riot. And it's this is its performance versus Bitcoin. Just put a little colon in here. And this is kind of a fun thing to do. I know you want to party with me. <laughs> but you can see it's really been strong compared to Bitcoin. And now it's it's got a little weakness in it compared to Bitcoin. But for the most part, it really has been outperforming Bitcoin. All right, let's hop back into crypto. Let's just take a look at Ethereum real quick. And then we'll um, open up for questions. Unless it's some uh, crypto you guys want to look at. But, you know, you really got to be on your toes with crypto because it heats up. And cools off really fast. But yeah, I'm looking forward to um, getting back into it heavily. All right, I'm going to go ahead and shift gears here. We'll go ahead and jump into stocks. If you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. Overall, today wasn't really that bad. There's a couple things that concern me, though. So the P's got whacked a little bit, but you know, they actually could use a little bit of correction. Remember, I talked about this flag ad nauseum in the trading service and in other presentations, and it did begin to take off out of it. It took, it took a little while to get going, but it took off nicely. And then now, if you squint your eyes and back the chart way out, this doesn't look like a whole lot in here. It's only down a little bit less than a three quarters of a percent today, and it could actually use a little bit more correction. I don't want it to correct, but it wouldn't surprise me if it corrected a little bit more. The NASDAQ got hit a little harder, down 2%, and a lot of that was in the semis. You can see we're not too, too far away from all-time highs. That's why the TFM 10% system, which is based on 50-week weeks high, 50 week highs, but you get the idea. It buys on strength, so we've been long this, or I've been long this one since uh, 319.49. Got whacked a little bit on that. That might be my fault. I was busy counting my money on that one. Feeling pretty smug, but uh, it happens. Spell the silent SH. Let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty, a bit of a bummer coming back in today, getting whacked a little. Off its worst levels, though, and it's recently probed the top of this wide and loose range. It has a little bit more overhead supply and then a lot of more overhead supply to get through. But as a general statement, it's doing pretty good. Somebody emailed me earlier and said that they are printing money in the the what's the IYW? And look at that. I mean, that's that's something that I've never thought about putting a TFM system on, TFM 10% system. But like the Rusty, it can be a little wide and loose, but boy, this recent run has been fantastic. And something like that TFM 10% system, 10% 10 system can work at something like that. See my other videos for more on that or go to YouTube slash Dave Landry and, and, and uh, search for it on my channel. All right, let's take a look. Gold, a commodity, you can see kind of rallied up, stalling out a little bit in here. If you listen to the radio, you're going to have to buy all the gold you can, but what do you what do you buy gold with? Dollars. So it's like, if gold's going up 200%, why do they want your dollars? So that's that's something I never could wrap my head around, but it is what it is. Energies actually ended a little higher today. They're wide and loose, so there's nothing to do there. That's why I hadn't talked about them lately. 
you know me, I like to see him break out of this range and not look back for a while. Obviously, a lot of new leaders have emerged in more recent times. Now, here's some good news here. The banks, remember we had the debacle a while back with the regionals imploding. Banks have done exceptionally well. They've broken out above this range. They're going up. I wouldn't rush out and buy them just yet. But I think it's pretty cool they're going up because they got whacked pretty hard. In fact, let's take a look at those regionals real quick. Regionals got slaughtered back here, and it looked like it was going to be the end of the world. And then all of a sudden, you can see we kind of have a head and shoulders bottom. And what I like about this particular head and shoulders bottom, now remember, I don't trade directly off of big picture technical analysis, but I do use it a lot in my analysis. So you've got kind of a shoulder back here. you got the head here. And this shoulder is lower than this shoulder over here. That's very important with the head and shoulder pattern. On the upside, you want that right shoulder to be higher than the left. And that's something that I'm sure somebody's written about it whenever I tell you something and how smart I am. I find out I find out years later that somebody else has been saying that or even 100 years ago. <laughs> if you look at some of these books like, um, what's the name? Uh, G.C. Selden, Livermore Schaubach, or Edwards and McGee. I'm sure if you dig out all those, somewhere in those, they'll, they'll talk about a right shoulder, a head and shoulder. But I do like the right shoulder to be lower for buys or to be bullish or in higher when you're looking at a head and shoulder to be bearish. Let's take a look at biotechnology. Biotechnology stalling at the top of his range. That's a bit of a bummer, kind of wide and loose. Here's the good news, though, speaking of drugs. Bam, look at that. Drugs are kind of all over the place. But they did take out the top of their range today. Let's not start kissing each other just yet. As usual, follow through will be key. But they had a decent day up a percent and a third, almost a percent and a half. And that's in spite of a crappy market. So that's kind of exciting. Manufacturing just uh, probed all time highs today, came back in a little bit. So far, so good. Nice, fairly persistent uptrend remains intact there. MNC got hit a little bit today. Take a look at like nail. Nail got whacked pretty hard, as you can see. If this high was lower, this would be kind of a really pretty. If this high was less than this high. That'd be a beautiful TKO, as George was pointing out um, in the group today. I think he was just talking about home builds in general. But yeah, they kind of TKO'd a little today. Longer term, though, still in a pretty darn good trend. Software just kind of pulling back in here, kind of a TKO type of move. Speaking of TKOs, but so far, so far, so good. Took out this little pivot point here. It's a trend pivot pullback it's a pattern, I call that's what I call it. And it's just had a bit of a TKO type of move. So that's pretty good. Transports, not an area I get that excited about, but they're going up. So that's a good thing. And they just probed right around this all time high level and they actually hung in there fairly well today. So that's a good thing. Now, here's, there's always something to worry about, right? Take a look at semis. The semis are a big bummer in here, down about three to third percent gap down, coming back down to where they just recently broke out from. Now, this is not the end of the world. It's still an uptrend, and we're just off of all time highs, but this certainly is a, a bit of a setback. And the great thing about all time highs is new highs begets new highs. So people are waiting for a market to sell off. And that sell-off never comes, and they throw in a towel, and then shorts, who are much smarter than the rest of the market, decide they're going to they're gonna show their brilliance by shorting things that are going up, and they keep going up, and then they get forced to cover. So all of that's kind of the psychology is built into something like the, T the TKO pattern. The Johnny come latest get shaken out, and then the market is in, the shorts get sucked in, and then when the market rallies, it you could take advantage of the predicament of those traders. But I don't like the gap in here. I wouldn't say that this is a TKO you want to trade, but the fact that you did have a knockout move today, if it doesn't follow through too, too much to the downside, then that would certainly be a good thing, of course, if it went right back up, took out, it filled this gap. Let's just say it fills this gap. Then those people who are waiting for that correction and didn't get in might pile in and the shorts will get squeezed out. So not going to count the semiconductors down and out just yet but today they did take a little bit of spanking retails wide and loose longer term 
it has been trending as of late, like most areas, down a little today, not the end of the world, but still looking pretty good. So overall, things still look pretty darn good. All right, let's take a look at uh, some of your stock picks. George wants to know about ROIV. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Let's back it out a little. I don't see a whole lot of old problems here. I got a little trading back here. Let's not worry about that too much. Short to intermediate term, it's kind of all over the place with these wide range bars up, wide range bars down. This bar is a little concerning here. So it, it doesn't have a whole lot of structure to it. As a general statement, yeah, it's trended higher and now it's beginning to knock out. But based on the the wide and loose nature, a little bit longer term, and based on these these tails, just crazy tails, I would leave that one alone. RDFN for John Redfin, I think. Oh, that looks good. Let's see if I can pick it apart a little bit. Nope. Nope, that looks pretty good. Um, it's a little crazy, and it does kind of trade in chunks. It could be a little wide and loose. I guess the only thing I can I can kind of pick apart is ideally I like to see the majority of a stock's move happen over over days to weeks as opposed to just one day. So you've got this big wide range bar here, but you do have another wide range bar here too, and I suppose that's okay. Um, I'm going to give you a not bad on this one. It could actually use a little more pullback, but if you pull back any further, then it would be back into this prior pullback. So it's kind of like I kind of have to work hard to pick it apart. I think that's where I'm going. So I'm going to give you a, a definite maybe on that one. And since you know what you're doing, I'm, I think you'll do okay. And by doing okay, I mean even if you get stopped out, you get stopped out. Okay, ZGN. ZGN looks okay. A little wide and loose, a little crazy longer term. And it just kind of barely took out all this fluff in here. It just, I don't know. It's hard for me to get too excited about this one. Again, it could use, it's kind of one of those cases where it could use a little bit more pullback. But if it pulls back much further, then you're back below where it broke out. So I would pass on that one. And maybe I'm being too much of a perfectionist, but right now, I'm finding not more stocks than I can handle, but plenty enough stocks, okay? You look at those two that I showed earlier. Um, I know the IPO one's a little unorthodox, but the other one is a nice Landry Light pullback that looked kind of exactly like all the other Landry Light pullbacks we've had lately. In fact, almost, I think, nine out of 10 of the last setups were Landry Light pullbacks. So, um, but I would pass on this one, George. KBH, KBH might be a go. Um, it's not bad. It is a TKO. I prefer if this high was a little bit lower. And, you know, I can kind of start picking these, even though the home builders are, are bullish on them, I can kind of pick them apart a little bit. I'm not really seeing any setups. Uh, in general, they are a little bit lower in HV. HV is 32. I'll give you a not bad on that one. Obviously, no overhead supply to deal with. And, and this, this I guess this bar is significant enough. Again, I prefer if this high was a little bit lower. So you're not buying right into brand new highs. You know, maybe an opening gap reversal might be worth looking at in the home builders tomorrow. So maybe think about that. Um, but yeah, it's not it's not bad. I, I'm personally not going to uh, trade this setup, but it's I'll give you a definitely... How about a definite not bad mod, which is auto parts. Let's take a look at this. Yeah, um, it's just coming off of all-time highs, which is not a bad thing. But as I often say, sometimes these stronger stocks, it's not super thick, so maybe it's not as much of a problem. But sometimes these stronger, stronger stocks, when the whole market gets moving, they can become a source of funds meaning that they'll sell the stronger stocks, they being institutions, and they'll buy something cheaper. And it needs more pullback. And the only problem with the more pullback, it's the same problem we just talked about, is if it pulls back any further, it's too close to the base. So I would pass just based on this alone, Keith, but uh, good that you brought up a trending stock that just begun to pull back. 
All right. Any more questions? Any more stock picks? Well, while we're at an impasse, kind of a Darvis box. Mod, kind of a Darvis box. Yeah, I hear you. Um, so the Darvis box, you're basically looking for a stock to to move from one box to the next. And forget about all this fluff back here, but let's say your box was like in here, okay? And so it moves to the next box. And then now you got a box up here and then it, it broke out again. I've done a few presentations on the Darvis box. So good eye on that, Jeff. I see what you're saying. And, and again, if you go to YouTube, you can find that. And you might be able to find it on my website. There is a search on my website where you can find a lot of a lot of stuff, a lot of good stuff, if I say so myself, hundreds, if not, uh, well, hundreds <laughs> of articles. All right, uh, going once, going twice. Well, obviously, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, daviddavelander.com. Leave a comment below if you watch on YouTube. I'll be happy to answer it. I, I answer all comments that require answering or that I think should be answered. Anyway, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, everybody here tonight, I'll see you tomorrow on Facebook. Everybody else, have a great weekend. Thank you so much. You are welcome, Sam, Jeff, George. Thank you so much.